Well, good, good day, everybody. Um, once again, the Michigan chapter is bringing you an, another webinar uh, with uh, another important topic. And people have been well, going through 2020 and, uh, you know, we all know about stress and we all know about how, how to try, try to address it. So today, doctor, we'll talk a little bit about it. And uh, with, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael with the proper introduction. So thank you very much for joining us with the Michigan chapter on web webinar today, holistic approach to stress management. To you, Michael. I appreciate the invitation, um, John. It is, uh, as always, a pleasure to be at the presence of Scarderma Foundation. And I'm sure most of us are going through hard time of stress during the Corona era. And I bet people with autoimmune diseases, especially Scarderma, it's even added. So I hope this next 45 minutes, an hour, I'd be able to give some tools that they can face the stress right on. Well, thank you, doctor. And I'd like to give Michael, I'll let Michael give you the proper introduction on your credentials and, and uh, what this webinar and who is brought to you by. So Michael. Good morning. You. Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. I am Michael Bessert. I'm a patient advocator. I would like to welcome everyone to the Scleroderma Foundation of Michigan Chapters web-based educational series. This webinar is being offered as part of our strategic planning efforts to move towards web-based learning experiences for the next four years in an effort to reach more patients, caregivers, and family members who are seeking to obtain accurate information about scleroderma. These webinars reach scleroderma patients and their family members from all over the world emphasizing the importance of quality educational programming for the scleroderma community. This educational program is made possible in parts by grants, grants, excuse me, from Ectalon Pharmaceuticals US Incorporated and Boehringer Ingerheim and Trico Foundations. We thank them all for their continued support. This webinar is being presented by Dr. Gurgis. Dr. Gurgis is a doctor of naturopath Pathic, there you go, excuse me, medicine and certified stress management consultant and therapist. She received her BSN in Iran and continued her education by specializing in intensive care in Switzerland. She obtained her doctorate in naturopathic medicine in the United States. She is also a member of the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals and a board member for the Scleroderma Foundation Michigan chapter. She has worked as a stress management consultant and naturopathic doctor in both Maryland and Michigan. Dr. Gurgis gives talks and seminars about various autoimmune diseases and aging. She also has published many articles on various subjects from food to herbs and lifestyles on different websites. She has published CDs for guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, and autogenic training. Most recently, Dr. Gurgis has published two books, The Holistic Approach to Stress and Path to Love, a poetry book. In her practice, she uses a variety of approaches in consulting with her clients, such as homeopathy, herbs, and food, and re re relaxation techniques. She also uses the FDA-approved with Fisher Wallace Sti Simulator. As with all new therapies, drugs are holistic. It is necessary for scleroderma patients to seek the advice of their own medical team to determine whether these approaches will be something that they can introduce into their life. Your medical team can best advise you because they know your medical history, the drugs you're taking and provide you with all the risk and benefits. Dr. Gurgis. I appreciate the introduction, Michael. I just wanna add that I have my third book, uh, which is a Holistic Approach to Autoimmune Disease that came out a month ago. I have yet put it on the market because uh, I am trying to find a venue that's more appropriate for doing so. So um, let's start. Next slide, please. Next. This is a picture of my books, by the way. If there is any question, any issue, feel free to contact me at curenaturally.org and email me at contactcurenaturally at gmail.com. This is my own email. And our book, um, I don't want to sound like a sales 
you know, salesperson, but our books are, um, my books are at the Scleroderma Foundation site. And if any time purchase, it will go 20 to 40% will go toward the foundation. Next, please. Because it is a, a era of coronavirus and it is a political, the time that we are all very charged politically, I thought that meditation, love and kindness meditation will be a good way of connecting with, the, with everybody. And um, this is something that, uh, these phrases, you can change it the way you wish. And you can say it three times when you are in line of grocery store or on the phone waiting for the salesperson or whoever, or lay down and just repeat it three times or more, first towards yourself, then three times or more toward a stranger, somebody that you met in grocery store, somebody you met that you have no connection in elevator. And then the third time, you do it towards someone you have difficulty to get along. Uh, let's start. I'm just going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to repeat it only once. And, uh, but you can take that and practice it every day if you wish. May I be healthy and live a life free of pain. May I be healthy and live with the body that gives me energy. May I be happy with joy in my heart. May I live at peace with serenity in my life. May I live with ease that comes from physical and mental well-being. This has been many research toward love and kindness meditation. And the scientists have um, concluded it lowered the level of anger. It does decrease pain. I remember Michael saying he, he had pain. And this is a good way of decreasing the level of pain. Decreased level of PTSD. PTSD. It does increase level of empathy. It increased the connection to others. It increased compassion, which we need so much these days. And most importantly, it also does lengthen the, um, lengthen the telomerase. And telomerase is like a shoelace, a cap at the end of the shoelace at, in chromosome that protects it. And the shorter it gets, indication that our, you know, we are getting age, age faster. So it improve our age, um, our longevity. So keep practicing it. It's a good way. Oh, one more thing. When you practice that, scientists have noticed some, um, after three months of practicing, the effect of it lasted about uh, 15 months, even if you don't practice it. Next, please. In this um, next 45 minute, I would like to address and make sure that we understand what the stress is. What does it happen to us? And also, um, how can we live with the stress? You know, by changing perspective, exercising, uh, changing nutrition and learning about different stress management technique, improve our sleep and have emotional support and then conclusion, concluding remarks. Next, please. What is a stress? In my opinion, is anything that disturbs emotional and mental and physical homeostasis, our balance. Next, please. In 19, early 1930s, uh, a physiologist from Harvard named Walter Cannon uh, introduced a concept 
of body's response to stress. He called it fight or flight. But he meant by that, that our body, even though as sophisticated as we might think, is exactly the same as our respond to stress the same way that our ape ancestors, cavemen. So what it means that when we perceive stress, our body respond in two ways. Either we run away from it or we decide to fight it out. Unfortunately, today's um, you know, 21st century, that's not applicable because we are sitting behind our desk, we are at home, we are not doing this running away or fighting because otherwise it would be very inappropriate if we punch the person. So um, in 1950s, uh, Dr. Hans Seele, an Austro-Hungarian endocrinologist working at McGill University, uh, did his research on stress. And he came with what's called now as general adaptation. He, this, uh, he came up with the, um, defining stress in three phases, alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. It was very interesting because he was, when he became a medical school student, he started to, uh, he noticed that patients, when they come to clinic for various sickness, various infection, they have similar symptoms. And they have, you know, the, their liver issues and thymus and glands and they have similarities. He brought the attention to his faculties and they sort of dismissed it, you know, just new students asking too many questions and said, no, that's not safe. He let it go, but then when he became faculty himself and he was doing research by giving different hormone to the rats, and you know, when you do that, you cause lots of physical stress. And I'm sure if the rat had, could speak, there's a lots of emotional because you hold them, you grab them, you inject them, and they don't understand what's going on. So there are lots of stress. But what he noticed that no matter what kind of hormone he would inject to the rat, they end up having similar result. At first he was puzzled, you know, he thought maybe there's an error. He, they went through all meticulous inspection to see what's going on and they realized no. But then he thought maybe that is stress, maybe they, you know, pressure, the, you know, the strain he caused to the rats, causing all the symptom. And he remembered his long ago when he saw those patients. So he started studying and of course, you know, he came up with the general adaptation syndrome. And interestingly, he's known as father of stress. And he had a very well, um, very interesting quote that said, I have done many autopsies and I have yet to see anyone dying from an old age. You know, he was, that's how much he believed stress is what's killing us. Next, please. There are many um, symptoms, uh, many systems involved in stress, but the main ones are central nervous system, endocrine and hormonal and immune system. It's, there's a field called psychoneuroendocrine immunology that looks at the whole involvement. Next, please. But what does really happen to us? What is it? I, I know that stress has become such a common use of word that it almost sounds cliche. Is the stress bad for us? Absolutely not. In fact, there was a scientist in early 1900, they um, looked and they um, noticed that stress, it's, it, was, it became known as Yerk Dawson Law. It, stress initially is good for us. I mean, in a small level, it's actually a spice of life. It makes us very, um, Everything, my, our perception is very increased. Our memory is improved. It has a lots of positive things for us. But then this 
Yerk Dawson law, to some degree, it goes and this productivity because of stress goes up. And then when you go too long, then start going down the curve. So stress is good for us. It makes us get up in the morning and look something to do. It's good. So it shouldn't be dismissed as always negative. However, it's different when it's continuous space and becomes chronic. What happens? Well, imagine yourself, you're walking in an alley. It's late at night, it's dark, and you hear that boom, 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 footstep behind you. You immediately, your body tense up. Spontaneously, your heartbeat goes faster and you start breathing. That's your autonomic nervous system kicking in. You turn around and you look in the back and you see a mom, you know, with their baby running to her car. You say, oh, thank God, you know, and you relax. Per your perception is that it is okay, it's not danger. But imagine if it was the opposite. If you looked and you saw that it is seem kind of weird and you become, at this time, you perceive a danger. It's a, your decision, your perception. At this time, your hypothalamus, your hypothalamus about the size of an almond or grape, is start releasing cortical releasing factor or cortical releasing hormone. And then this affects your pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is the size of green pea. And at this time, pituitary gland releases releases adrenocorticotrophin hormone. And this adrenocorticotrophin hormone release goes all the way to adrenal gland, which is sitting on top of kidneys. And at this time, your medulla, the center of the adrenal gland, releases more epinephrine, noroepinephrine. And then your cortex, releases cortisone, mineral corticoid, and glucocorticoids. What does that translate? Next, please. Here again, you know, hypothalamus, cortical releasing hormone, pituitary, adrenocorticotrophin hormone, and cortisol. Next, please. What does that mean? You know, I don't want to, mm, that's another picture for it. Next. What does that mean in our body physiologically? When cortisol is released, it increases, it is trying to prepare you for fight and flight. How does it do that? It increases by dumping everything except kitchen sink. Your sugar goes up. Everything gets converted to glucose. Your protein, your fatty acid, everything get converted so you can have enough energy to fight that predator, you know, that animal, whatever it is, like your ape caveman. Your cortisol also affect the, um, you know, your neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, neuropeptide, things that are really important for our balance psychologically and activities that goes in our body. And all that, on top of that, aldosterone is released, which retains salt and retains sodium, increase the volume of blood because you need to go fight that predator. So your body is getting, so excessive, imagine if it goes on and on and on it becomes toxic, it becomes, you become loaded with free radical and at the end you're damaging. In addition, the insulin is, you become desensitized to insulin because the sugar is released so much you become resistant. So what is, means, um, next please. What does that mean physically? means that all the energy, all our resources are geared to it to make us strong. Meaning what? Meaning that muscles, our muscle that is needed to fight that predators are 
the blood flow is shunted toward them. Our heart beat faster because wants to bring more blood, wants to bring more energy, wants to bring more nutrient toward those big muscles so we can fight the predator. Our breathing become faster to bring more oxygen to those muscles so we can fight the predator. Your pupils get dilated so you can see better what is coming to you. Your nostril gets flares up because you want to breathe, bring more oxygen so you can go fight. Your blood pressure goes up. Your blood vessel get constricted so to increase and push the blood forward to the muscles, to the region, to your lung, to your heart, to increase the capability of you fighting. And liver, of course, release sugar, fat, etc., to the bloodstream. Next, please. So imagine what happens. Continuously, you are having, uh, you know, if you have, let's say if it was one incident, one big stressor, after that, your body goes to back to homeostasis. Sometimes it takes a few days because your thyroid hormones also get affected and it takes later to kick in. You know, many people complain, oh, I'm so exhausted all the time. I don't know why, because I'm not doing anything. Why am I so exhausted? They don't realize that there's a lot going on in your body, within your system. Your body is working too much. So your cardiovascular, because your blood pressure is kept high, because you have palpitation all the time, you know, one stress after another, you run from the dark alley, you come home, you see all this unwashed dishes, you see the kids making noise, or if they're awake or you teenage, it's, it adds up. So you're constantly having your heart working hard, therefore leading to angina, leading to irregular heartbeat, leading to high cholesterol, heart attack, your digestive system. Your digestive system is not an essential worker when it comes to stress. So what does it happen? If you have food, your blood is flown towards heart and lung, the food stays undigested. Imagine that happening days after days. You start developing indigestion. You start developing gastritis, peptic ulcer, irritable bowel syndrome. Your breathing, your, you know, you start developing asthma. Your tension that you feel in your muscle, in your back, in your neck, and you know, you start having pain. Your immune system, your immune system is again not essential. So therefore, it, it start, you know, you become more sick. The connection between immune system and stress is very well known. You know, you start having you know, allergies, and you start developing autoimmune diseases and cancer and reproductive system. You know, how many times you have heard people who couldn't conceive, couldn't have baby, and there was lots of pressure from in-laws and families. And as soon as they adopted, then they start having their own baby. Again, because your reproductive system is not essential. So, and the same goes with the skin. I want to, you know, like scleroderma patients, they have skin problem. I'm not saying that that is the main cause, but stress plays huge role in it because skin is not essential worker. So therefore, you know, if you continuously not receive enough blood flow, then you start having skin problem, such as eczema, psoriasis, rashes, and general fatigue, depression, anxiety, and acceleration of aging. So imagine all of that because you have not managing, you are not managing your stress properly. Next, please. One second, doctor, I have a question. I, I'm, sure. going, I'm going to fall back. You want to increase your volume in your mic, please? Sure. Um, one of the things that I found out that when I was working is that when I was under a stressful situation as being, um, trying to hit a deadline and trying to hit deliverables, I became very focused and very 
how can you say it? It seems like it heightened my ability to concentrate or look at the problem. Um, is that an, an abnormal or not? No, actually, you're absolutely right. Um, I don't know if you remember my um, the first few slides. I talked about York Dawson Law, because at the actually, when you are under stress, to some degree, it's wonderful. It makes you function more, better. It makes you almost, like I said, look forward, and it improves your perception. I mean, not. Um, it improve overall focus and memory and but it is the i'm talking about chronic stress i'm okay. not talking about acute there's a huge difference between acute stressors meaning things that stress us and chronic stress okay. here everything i'm saying is addressing towards chronic stress okay thank you doctor sure there are lots of symptoms, but I am just, I've brought few important ones. We become irritable, hostile, depressed, jealous, restless, anxious, and sometimes feeling nothing is real. Everything seems sort of like, you know, separate from you. It doesn't seem real. It doesn't feel real. We have immediate, you know, we easily cry criticize other, we can't sleep good, we have nightmares, we are impatient, and we have very decreased sense and of positive. Next, please. So what do we do? In, uh, um, in my book, I have created six steps toward managing stress. Perception was not my number one, but I decided here to make it number one because it is really your body respond based on how you perceive things. There in 1998, um, NIH, National Institute of Health, looked overall um, for nine years of study and to see what's going on, how people who have higher stress and perceive that they have high stress, what is the outcome? And they found that they do much worse and they have 43% higher risk of premature death. So that's a very important to realize that perception of stress needs to be addressed. Next, please. So what do we do? You know, we talked about the stress, the effect of it. I compare it almost, I compare stress like, uh, like having a, let's just bring the example of coronavirus, like a hospital that's working perfect. Everything is in place. And then you have coronavirus, suddenly loads after load. And of course, because they're a good hospital, what they do, they try to prepare some, themselves ahead of time. But if you continue and the load is nonstop, imagine after a while the staff get tired or might get sick, et cetera, et cetera. And it cannot sustain that continuous workload. That is how stress is. So what I want you to do is make an appointment with yourself and then sit down and write down what is it that stresses me out and see what can I do for it. Is that right now in coronavirus era, unfortunately, um, you know, that's something that there's not much you can do. If it's financial, you know, you have to just come up with a solution. Can I borrow money from friends or bank, etc.? Is it loss of loved one? We need to go through the process of grieving. There are things that we cannot do, especially if you have already an autoimmune disease that you want to, in addition to all of that, the anxiety, what if I have to go to the hospital? But then sit down. I think sometimes we forget. We always, although control is very important, but at the same time, we need to think about a higher power, believing that there are sometimes things that happened for a reason. Maybe we can 
sit down and get connected with things that we ignored for a long time. We can use, look at it positively. For example, one of the things in Corona era is that look at the environment. I mean, look at the nature. It's much more beautiful because of the last pollution. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to say ignore the reality, but look at it in a positive way. Also use cognitive therapy, self-talk. I understand it's a difficult situation, but I am going to be able to handle it. I'm going to be mindful and take one step at one time. Come up with the solution once you identify if it is a marriage that doesn't work, if it is the kids, if it is job, come with the solution that is workable for you, applicable for you, and then start taking steps. Sometimes you might say, well, you know what? I have to live with it and that's okay too. Next please. For example, when once you decide you have to live with it, then you try to focus on a positive side, change your perception. I don't know if you, both you, Michael or John, if this picture is familiar for any of you, what do you see? What is it that you see there? I, I see an old woman and a young woman. Exactly, exactly. The, when you look at the old woman, this big nose, my arrow, I don't know if it shows, and the chin, and this is the hair. When you look at the young woman, you have the hair and you have eyelashes and beautiful cheeks and, you know, chin. And all. so you sit, look at the same picture and yet you see two different things. It's like same as half glass empty, you know, half glass full. Next, please. There is also when you decide that you want to live with the situation and you try to change your perspective, another option is to make yourself stress hardy. There was a scientist, um, Dr. Susan Cabasa in Chicago. He was a student, he was always impressed with High, when he was at high school, he would see that some people, when it's close to the exam, they hair pull, they are very restless, while others are calm and collected. And he always wondered what, what does make them so calm and collected. So when he became a doctor later on, he decided to do a study in a bunch of executives, what makes them stress hardy. And he found there are, they have three different things that he called them three C of stress hardiness. They are very committed. These people, no matter where they are, they are engaged. Like right now, you and Michael, John and Michael, you are engaged, you're present. You pay f attention. This is commitment. This is mindfulness. Also, these people had felt like they can control it. No matter what was thrown at them, they could handle it. So therefore, that was the second C. They looked at it as a challenge. Instead of saying, oh my God, this is a disaster and lose it, they look at it as a challenge. Wow, good, you know, I'm gonna make the best of this situation. So therefore, that made them stress hardy. I added two of my own. I believe that spirituality, spirituality doesn't necessarily mean that you have to believe in God or belong to certain religion. What I mean by spirituality, believing to higher power. That is sometimes we cannot control. And also having support that help you to go through difficult times. So those are my stress hardiness that I added to this tree. Next, please. Number two, I know um, that exercise is sometimes difficult for scleroderma patients. Some people cannot move as fast or cannot, but it's okay to start small. Why is it exercise matter? Because exercise proven it can treat psychiatric illness. Imagine that, psychiatric illness. 
schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, Alzheimer, dementia. So it's also even people who had a brain injury, they had they recovered after performing exercise. Some people ask me and say, well, you know, exercise itself is stress, you know, physical stress. What's the difference? I agree with them. It is a physical stress. But the difference is, if you remember what I told you earlier about physiology of stress, when you are under stress, everything is converted to sugar. So to meet that stress expenditure. But instead of spending it, what do we do? We do nothing. So it becomes destructive inside. But when you exercise, you spend that expenditure. So keep exercising. Next, please. Of course, exercise reduces stress. It also um, improves the glutathione, which is an antioxidant, and it repairs wear and tears. Next. It improves mood, it increases blood flow to the brain and minimize the plaque buildup. And of course, most importantly, it improves by burning those extra fat and calorie that we have as we released, that has been released into the blood as a result of stress. And another thing is improve with sleep help improve with sleep. I'm sorry, um, Michael, it seems like there are some, some grammatical mistakes here. I don't know, like they will also help with sleeping. And I noticed another one earlier, and I'm not sure it was supposed to be edited. I am usually send it to someone to edit. Just please make sure that they are edited later on because it seems like it's still some there. Sorry about that to go through that. Next, please. Oh, that's fine. No, don't, don't worry about it, doctor. Well, well, you know, we're all human. Don't, <laughs> don't stress about it. <laughs> Next, please. When we exercise after 25, no previous one, please. After 25 to 30 minutes, endorphins are getting released. And endorphins are important for pain, as I explained in previous um, uh, holistic approach to pain. It also um, improved the level of dopamine, which is very important for our health and mental being and dopamine, and also put our brain activity in, as you might know that our brain have different level that indicate what state we are. And when we exercise, we are in alpha state, which is sort of a relaxed state, so that improve also our brain um, waveform. Next, please. So, you know, many people, they just go with all those foreign names, which is good. Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga, they're all wonderful. They're all wonderful. But we can go as simple as walking the dog in the street, take the family member to go for a nice, you know, in the nature, just take our punching, you know, punching bag and punch the, and, you know, boxing uh, bag. Or if you love wrestling, you know, go to a wrestling match and be part of it and do this. Anything that is good for you. Play a tennis with your friend, anything. But the importance of it is I don't want you to just do a 35 to 40 minutes of exercise if possible. I want you to move all the time throughout the day. You know, even if you are in a small apartment, just go up the stairs, down the stairs, put the TV in front and do a jump rope if you can. Whatever, I know, again, start slow if you can't and belt on it. Next, please. Food and stress. Next. 
what is it, food and stress? You know, food is medicine, we know all that. And most importantly, neurons are cells that, in the more important cell nerves uh, that make up our, um, that, tra that transfer message from one to another and make things happen. How we feel, how we act, they're all because our neurons, neurons, and neurons, um, when they move a message between one neuron to another, there's a space. There's a space that is empty, so it needs to be jump start. And there is a neurotransmitter that gets released, and that no, those neurotransmitters are the one that transfer the message to the next receptor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and many of those neurotransmitters that play huge importance in our mental well-being are brought by food. Without them, we can't have. Go ahead, please. We can't. They, they, we won't have enough. Uh, for example, you know the most neurotransmitters are from either amino acid, which is a building block of protein, or fat substance called choline. Next, please. So what do we do? We want to eat food that are good for stress. Number one, I always come for what is bad for you. Eliminate what is not good. Sugar, get rid of it. I know it's hard because sugar is addictive. And many of us like our pies and I, but get slowly, get rid of it. Salt, because again, during the stress, we retain our salt so we can increase the flow of, and improve the blood pressure. It's not good for us. Caffeine, I know it's a hard one because I love caffeine, my coffee in the morning, but caffeine has thousands of chemicals. Some of are good for us, but as far as stress is concerned, it is a stressor. It acts like you're under stress. It, you know, makes palpitation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would suggest drink decaf or drink one cup of coffee. Coffee lasts 12 hours. So if you have one at 3 p.m., then you can be sure that you're going to be up, not able to sleep until 2, 3 a.m. Alcohol. I have. I'm a. Um, I cringe when I hear this. Uh, people and in, in news, I hear that oh, the bars are open. Oh, people are going to the bar during Corona and they're celebrating. But I. It is really sad because I know that there are lots of business, economical, you know, hardship, and we need places open. But alcohol is bad for us. Alcohol, in so many ways, it's bad, especially when it comes to stress, especially when it comes to autoimmune disease, because it prevents, it may relax us at the very beginning, but then it, we wake up, we go to sleep, but then we wake up. And it also prevents absorption of essential vitamins, like vitamin B, vitamin C, you know, essential nutrient, and it destroys the microbiome, you know, the composition from the time that we drink it to all the way. So stay away from it. Smoking, you already know all about it. Food sensitivity, if you're sensitive to food and respond to it, it's important to find and get rid of it. Next, please. Include probiotic. More and more scientists are realizing that the bacteria in our guts are very important in our mental health, especially when it comes to stress. Gamma butyric acid, amino acid, dopamine, serotonin, they all are important for our health and well being and their relation to anxiety, stress, and depression. So, have food, fermented food, have food that do affect GABA, dopamine, serotonin. And 
I used to believe that it's good to get it from natural source in your probiotic. That was like 10 years ago or seven, eight years ago. But now I see that probiotic manufacturing has improved and it is okay to take over-counter probiotics. Next, please. Because they're very, very important for our health. And um, consumption, scientists have found, consumption of probiotic increases, um, I mean, prevent from increase of adrenocorticotrophin hormone. If you remember, those are the ones that stay, start the whole um, stress cascade. And it does weaken the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access and um, it has many benefits that I would, uh, especially, next please, especially scientists have found that in uh, studies, probiotic that contain lactobacillus, helivectus, and bifidobacterium longum, they do reduce stress-induced gast gastrointestinal um, discomfort. That's very important. So if you get a um, probiotic over counter, make sure that they are they have Lactobacillus helveticus and bacterial bifidobacterium. Um, and in also in double blind study, they noticed that the people who took probiotic they had reduced anxiety and alleviated behavioral and psychological distress. And you can also, of course, have fermented food and um, there are a list of um, what food to take for improving um, probiotics in my book. And I have to, I've written many articles. You can get it from food source as well, especially fermented one. Next, please. Another thing to look for, it's tryptophan. Tryptophan is found in meat, milk. It is, tryptophan is building block for serotonin, dopamine, uh, epinephrine, and uh, it can be found in, you know, vegetarian source, such as, I'm sorry, something in my computer went, I'm sorry, it's, my computer is acting up. Uh, so vegetarian source like quinoa, hemp seed, tofu, tempeh, and um, choline, you can find it in egg, in you know, eggs and uh, wheat germ, et cetera. Sometimes, you know, tryptophan is obtained from protein and from meat, et cetera. And it is hard sometimes to just have protein alone, because when you eat protein, even though it's very important for increasing level of tryptophan, but once you eat protein, you have um, other amino acids, they all compete to get into the brain, past the blood brain barrier and get into the blind, say, brain. So it becomes too crowded. But if you have a little bit of a complex carbohydrate next to it, that insulin takes care of those other five. So then tryptophan can get into the brain and have, you know, therefore the increased level. Next, please. So to just wrap it up, what do we do? Make sure you have protein have a small amount of carbohydrate, the kind that you as an autoimmune disease patients, as a scleroderma patients are not sensitive to, a small amount. And then add vitamins. Take a multivitamin because it has iron, it has selenium, it has E. But in addition to that, I encourage people to take B complex and C because C is amazing benefit for in case of scleroderma autoimmune diseases. I would go for like thousand um, a day or even you know more if needed, because it's a water soluble. It can get rid of it. It doesn't get accumulated. 
But B complex are very important when it comes to stress, it comes to depression. So I would definitely take that. And in addition, make sure to add probiotic. Another word, if you want a natural resources, get rainbow collar vegetable and probiotics and meat, etc. Next, please. Number four, sleep. I know that people have lots of trouble sleeping. Next, please. And um, especially as we get older, you know, sleep deprivation can short our temper. 50% of people who have sleep deprivation, they have psychological disorder, they have depression, and they have um, increased hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access activities and more stress hormones circulating in our blood. So in other words, stress becomes higher when we, sleep, we are sleep deprived. Next, please. Then during sleep, I am sure most people know that our breathing goes lower, our body is relaxed and it, uh, growth hormone is released, which is crucial for development and for growth and cytokines, which is important for, for infection and inflammation is produced. So uh, what do we do? Next, please. What do we do to get sleep? If you remember our ancestor, if the sun was down, they would go to bed. Sunrise, they would get up. I'm not saying to follow them because otherwise we will have a short day, especially in Michigan. But I'm just saying that uh, try to create a routine. Go always at the same time, get up at the same time because then your body's internal clock get used to it and you feel sleepy as you get close. Watch what you're eating. Sometimes close to your bedtime, eating big meal, it's not a good idea. And a spicy meal, it's not a good idea. Maybe having a um, little bit of a almond milk or coconut milk, put, put some turmeric and some chamomile tea, add a chamomile tea bag in it. It makes you sleep it relaxes you and it's good for you. Avoid, of course, caffeine, alcohol, and don't exercise close to bedtime. And get out of the bed if you cannot sleep. Unfortunately, you know, before the corona era, I wrote many times, I mean, several times, article about staying away from our gadgets. It's like, in, you know, we can't live with it and we cannot live without it. I mean, if it wasn't for technology right now, we wouldn't be able to, you know, get close to our patient group and talk to them. So it's important, we love our gadgets, but it is not a good idea to sleep with it. It's not a good idea to be connected. So get all of your equipment if you can, if you have more than one room, get it out of the room so it doesn't, you know, send magnetic field, it doesn't create a magnetic area in your room. And sometimes it's a good idea to leave the window open if you can, if it's not cold, fresh air to come in, help you with your sleep. Next, friends. That's something that has proven that it is amazing for our health, psychological, mental, physical to have support system. I'm not talking about having the same community of color or religion or no, but have create a community. In 1300, King, King Frederick conducted an experiment. He wanted to see if you don't talk to newborn babies, would they speak German? He wanted to see their and then he also instructed to the, he instructed two things to the nurses, do not talk to them, do not hug them. Guess what happened? They were failure to thrive, and after a while, they died, 22 of them. 
that should show how important it is for us to communicate, to talk to each other, to hug if we have loved ones around us. Next, please. In another study with cancer patients, those who participated to support group lived 18 months longer than others who did not. I can attest to that I was participating in support group with cardiac patients, those who came and expressed this commonality brings close bonding and makes us improve our mental, psychological well-being. Next, please. In a survey of 127, 545 American adults, they found that those who are married, they live longer than um, healthier than divorced or widowed. Again, I'm not encouraging rushing to get married because sometimes unhealthy marriage is more poisonous and it's detrimental to our health. But if you can, if you are a health and good, you know, married, good for you. And it's good to have a partner that you feel like compatible and you improve your well-being. Next. So what do we do? You know, if you're alone and you live by yourself, what do we do? You know, it's, it's important to start working on yourself if there are issues. It's not a good idea, oh, it's always somebody else's problem, jump from relationship to relationship. Focus on improving. Write down, how can I improve? How can I develop a sense of trust others and others trust me? Because trust is the foundation for every relationship. If you lie, if you cheat, if you do things, after a while you find yourself lonely. Many reasons, but I'm bringing trust as a foundation. Once you work on yourself and you know how to address it, then join community that is compatible for you. You know, I always say spirituality and religion because I consider myself, I'm a Muslim and I consider myself a very religious person. I might not be traditional, you know, view of Muslim, but I pray and I, you know, what I'm saying that find someone who is compatible with you, not trying to say my religion is better than others or I'm better than, but find group, organization, go to the classes. I'm talking about after Corona. Not right now, we have a once in a lifetime occasion, sit down and analyze. Find, if nothing works, find a pet. It always works, especially dogs. I love our dog. It's wonderful. They're always there to give you love unconditionally. Next, please. Technical approach. Number six. It is important to include daily, as you do include anything else, your job, your task, include a technical uh, stress management that works for you. Previous talk I addressed, I talked about autogenic training for scleroderma foundation patients because it has shown to do the work on renal phenomena. And that's very concerning for scleroderma patients. I also like to do, encourage people to laughter therapy, to include laughter therapy. Just, you know, laugh out loud for 15 minutes. People might think you're crazy, you're laughing and nothing funny, but that's okay. Because laughter has shown over and over, it reduces stress, it improves circulation, it improves immune system, it decreases pain. It's like internal juggling. You know, Dr. Norman Cousin in 1979, he had a autoimmune disease and he was the point that he was receiving pain medication every like 10, 15 minutes. He was a faculty in the hospital. And um, 
Finally, the, you know, his friend said, you know, I'm sorry, we can't really manage anymore. There's nothing we can do for you. We are going to send you to an apartment next to the hospital, and they're going to come and give you pain medication. Do whatever you like. And he started watching funny sitcoms. He just kept laughing. And then he realized, oh, wow, you know, I went an hour without pain medication, two hours, etc. And he actually cured himself. When he came back to the hospital, residents and stuff, they, they were like, you have to write a book. So he, he wrote Anatomy and Illness. And Dr. Uh, Kataria, from, Kataria from India, he developed a technique called laughter yoga, that people get together and laugh. I encourage Scleroderma Foundation to create a laughter yoga class. You know, find someone who can teach. You can do it in the area era of coronavirus. You can do it online. You know, just get together and start laughing. You, I'd be more than happy to teach if that's needed. You have, you know, do the progressive muscle relaxation. But of course, there are many other techniques. And as um, Michael said in my bio, I already have CD about autogenic training, training, guided imagery, and um, another one I forgot right now. But, and my book tells you what to do. But there is, do what you love. Dance, sing, include few of those and see which one you like the best. Next, please. So, to conclude, we have, if there are situation that we cannot change the stress after we sit down, make an appointment with ourselves, if there are situation that cannot be changed, try to become stress hardy, try to look, find positive things every day. I, gratitude is one way to approach. Include food, that are good for you every day. Get rid of the toxins. Walk, exercise, sleep, create a community of your own with like-minded people. Include deep breathing. We are breathing, whether we want it or not. Why not making sure it is deep breathing once in a while. We have tendency, we take our gadget, we are constantly bound, crouch forward, and we are reducing the volume of oxygen in our lungs because we are, you know, bending over to look at the computer. It is important to improve your posture. Make your sure you have your hand in your belly and chest and see which one rises. If your chest is rising without your belly, then you are breathing by your chest and that's not your, your it's, you need to have a, you know, belly rise. You can lay down, don't stress over it. Lay down and put your hand and see how you can change it to belly breathing. And do that every few hours, take a few deep breaths. And again, I um, encourage you to do that love and compassion meditation. You know, that in the era of coronavirus, we realized how similar we are, how connected we are. And it is important to understand to really, truly, we are made of love. Try to connect to each other and respect others, different tradition, add, you know, we don't want all of us eat one kind of food, look alike, appreciate the difference and love the universe. Get rid of things that are toxin in your life. Do I have too many things? Get rid of them. Organize your life spiritually, physically, mentally, in all ways. Add laughter. In addition, add herbs, 
you know, like I mentioned chamomile, valerian, but I don't want it, you know, I mentioned it in my book, but it's important to talk to herbologists, you know, to, and add homeopathy. Next, please. Again, create a plan, evaluate, and see where you can go from now. In include things that I mentioned. When you get up, I don't know if you're like me or different. I always write what is need to be done. And I don't do it over the computer. I just have to have a pen and paper. It's an old habit. I write down include meeting with yourself for a cup of herbal tea and some deep breathing or laughter. Do kindness meditation. Do your mindfulness. And evaluate the resources. Can I do any of those? Do I need help? You know, just, I hope you look at this talk at the beginning of new life for you. Stress is not just affecting us head to toe, but stress is a way of life. And when you manage it, you change your way of life. So I hope in this 45 minute or an hour, I don't, I lost track of time. I get passionate and I start talking a lot. I hope that you learn how to manage your stress and live a healthier life in general. Thank you for invitation again. And uh, go feel free to do the love and kindness meditation. Again, I'm gonna read it this time. I'm gonna send it towards you, Michael and John. May I be happy. May you be happy and feel the joy in your heart. May you be healthy and live with a body that gives you energy. May you be safe and protected from harm. May you be in peace that comes from well-being. Thank you for listening. Well, thank Any you. Very, thank you very much, Doctor, and uh, and back to you. Uh, you know, may may you be blessed for for your 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 work with scleroderma and work with your patients and helping us. So I say thank you again. My pleasure. Anytime. I think your 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 presentation was was excellent. I mean, I think uh, everyone, you know, sitting back and li well listening to this will be able to take something from that and be able to learn as being from whether or not how to reduce stress or how what to do for changing of their life and maybe just a just I think understanding what stress is and how it affects them and what they can do to improve upon it. And I think that the things that you always hear about, you know, exercise, do this, do that, but the other little things that are, can be very helpful. So I say thank you again, uh, Doctor, for, for your presentation today. My pleasure. Anytime. I would, uh, I would also like to add a thank you because this really, this validated a lot of things. As, as you know, I'm a patient advocate, but um, early in 2019, I was also diagnosed with illness-induced PTSD. Um, I, I, I was in denying that because I, I thought that was related to the military. But as I look back, I have been fighting these PTSD issues for years. Scleroderma just really heightened it. So um, I, I have removed toxins from my life. Most of them are people. It's unfortunate, but... Um, people that I have tried to explain that I have PTSD and they don't get it. They don't understand scleroderma. And, and I finally have to put it down. I said, you can either be my friend or a trigger. You can't be both. And I have set boundaries up and uh, I always live one day, one step at a time um, from two to four daily. I, I, I close out the world. I, I, I take a nap. I, I just go into deep meditation, but that is my time and nobody else's. And my wife knows it, my family knows it, and most of my friends knows it. Um, but it, it's kind of, so you validate a lot of things and it was very nice. And um, especially when you get into the, the mind wandering with the what ifs, the woulda, shoulda, couldas, you just, I just have found too that I just tell myself, stop. Just stop and move on. 
But um, I want to add this. This is kind of interesting because I think at times people, and I can say this, um, when we get into a situation where our PTSD is really good, it's almost like we're fainting goats, but we don't faint, you know, because that's what a fainting goat is. They are just so stressed out. Their body is just overwhelmed. They just faint. And, and most human beings don't realize that people are that way too, that you put them under amount of stress like that. They're, they, they don't faint like a goat, but the, the chemistry, and I seen this, I know firsthand the, you know, just that anger that builds up and to be able to control that by the, um, the, the lessons you've taught us today is just, just wonderful. So I thank you very much for this. It, it, I'm, helped, I'm glad that it helped me to... tremendously. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. So My pleasure. Anytime. Yep. Thank you for okay. invitation. Um, if that's everything then, John, nope. I, got, I, got, I got my wrap up if there's anything else or. Why don't you wrap this up, Michael? And so, you know, so thank you very much, doctor. So Michael, we're going to turn it over to you for, for our close. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Again, I want to thank all of you for viewing this webinar. Staying educated about scleroderma is so important. This is the reason that the Michigan chapter strategically has created web-based educational experiences. Being educated can help the scleroderma community to become better healthcare advocates. I hope you'll join us for all of our education, educational webinars and for more information, check our website, which is all small letters, scleroderma.org forward slash Michigan, or the National Scleroderma Foundation weekly e-letter that is delivered to your email every Friday. Thank you again for sharing your time on this webinar, and thank you very much, Dr. Gurgis. My pleasure. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have a good day, all. You too. Bye-bye. Thank care. you. My pleasure.